Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there. Got a show today that's kind of topical. I, I hope you'll in, be interested in this. Uh, I think a lot of you guys like professional basketball, and I bet a lot of you guys, if they haven't watched the Netflix story on Tim Gottahe, Gottahe, the uh, I can never pronounce that guy, so <laughs> Tim Gottahe. Uh, the referee, the NBA referee, who, you know, really had a, a, a stellar career. He went up into the NBA quick, and he seemed like he's a pretty personable guy. And But he got caught up in some gambling and some betting, was betting on his own games. And, and, and he has his own story. I tried to get him on the show a year or so ago, and he talked to me, but he was, you know, I think he already thought he was too big for me, and I know he thinks he's too big now. But, uh, you know, he's one of those guys and, and he got involved indirectly. I don't know if he knew he was involved with the mob, but, but the mob was making money off of him. And, and so we have a, a guest who's been on the show before talked about the black mafia in Philadelphia. It was really an interesting story. If you, if you didn't see it or you don't remember it exactly, go back and, and just search in my, on the podcast or online or whatever, or Sean Patrick Griffin and the Black Mafia in Philadelphia, and, and you'll find that show. So this is Sean Patrick Griffin of uh, Philadelphia, and I can't remember all your credentials. I'm going to let you say them, Sean. Welcome. Thanks for having me back, Gary. I am currently a professor of criminal justice at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, and my law enforcement background is meager compared to many of your guests and to you. I was only a Philadelphia police officer. I wasn't a detective or anything noteworthy, um, but I come from a cop family. My brother is still a homicide detective and has been for decades. And my father had, uh, I think he retired 24 years. So between the three of us, we've got more than 60 years of experience. But I was by far the lesser of all of them. I, I in academia. So. And I always joke, if, if when, when we were cops, if you dialed 911, you didn't want my father, you didn't want me, you wanted my brother. He was <laughs> of the family. He was a good cop. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, as your careers progressed in academia and in criminal justice, uh, administration of justice uh, area, and, and so you really have gotten into organized crimes, whether criminal organizations, mm -hmm. whether it be yeah. the Black Mafia or Italian Mafia or whatever, mm -hmm. right. and, and, and be, have become an expert in that area. And, and and when you first, I guess, maybe saw this Netflix, I, I don't know how much you knew about Tim Donaghy before, but kind of how did you get started? this? Because I'll tell you guys, he has an idea about this. And, and if you watch that Netflix documentary, if you read his book, it's pretty self-serving. And, and he, he contends that he never rigged a game. He never did anything to manipulate an outcome as a referee, even though referees can manipulate an outcome pretty easily. And he only did some of his actions that were a bit suspect because he was doing what the NBA wanted. And that was take care of franchise players and, and keep fans happy and keep them coming back. You don't want your Michael Jordans or LeBron James to foul out. Uh, so, um, and, and then he knew that. So he, he, he had an edge on winning and then he shared it with other people. So Tim, uh, how to start out, how did you get into this? Well, with regard to my background, uh, when I left policing and I went into academia, my, my main research area for the last almost 30 years now has been organized crime. Uh, that's how you and I met. That's most of my publications. That's the stuff that you see me on TV, like A&E, Discovery. It's generally speaking, organized crime. So I also do white collar crime and a little bit of policing research, but it's 80% probably organized crime. So when the scandal hit in 07 and it was reported that the Gambino squad of the FBI in Brooklyn had heard on wires. At the time, it was unclear if it was during wiretaps or informants, but regardless, had found out about an NBA official betting on his own games. And you think, okay, well, obviously, then organized crime had some involvement, and that piqued my interest. I followed news like everybody else all throughout 2007 and pretty much you know, thought we knew the story. At the time, I was promoting my, my last book, the book that we, I, you and I talked about before, Black Brothers Incorporated. And I was doing a media tour for that, and somebody contacted me because they saw me on TV. And they said, hey, um, have you considered writing about the NBA betting scandal? And I told this person, no, because what is there to say? I mean, it's been all over the news. It's pretty much cut and dry, you know. 
And he said, I don't think you really understand what's going on here. Um, if you notice in the news, you haven't heard any mention of the professional gamblers. And I can give you access to the people who were in charge of the betting scheme. Now, the public at that point, and I was, of course, just like everybody else, had never heard of a coterie of professional gamblers who were betting on the games. That was news. So I said, all right, well, at a minimum, I'll meet with these people to see if there's anything noteworthy. But keep in mind, my focus at the time was organized crime. So I'm thinking, all right, well, in my world of academia, no one at that point in time had ever researched what I call big time uh, professional gambling, meaning the people who bet millions every day, it's their primary job. Now, keep in mind, Gary, and for your audience, this is back when sports gambling was illegal. So it wasn't simply betting. It was figuring out how do you launder the money? How do you you know deal with all the tax evasion issues? So anyway, so I thought, well, this would be great because even if I do know about the NBA betting scandal, I'll definitely, as an academic, get to figure out the sociology of how all that money has moved around and what relationship, if any, organized crime has with this. Because, you know, for people in our line of work, we're used to mobsters dealing with local bookmakers, but they're betting small sums of money. It's not consequential. These guys were literally betting millions of dollars every game, every day. And uh, so anyway, so I met with one of the pro gamblers. I actually described this in Game in the Game, my book on the scandal. And I met with him for half of an hour. And I thought, oh, my goodness, we all knew nothing about this. And I knew right away, holy smokes, what a huge project this is going to be. So I started writing a game what became Game in the Game in 2007. And importantly for your audience, since we're talking about this primarily because Untold, the Netflix episode, Operation Flagrant Foul, that was the FBI's title of the of the oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, I I bought Tim Donaghy published a book in 2009 when he got out of federal prison well I was doing the research for gaming the game so I bought the book yeah and listen I say this all the time you don't need access to Sean Patrick Griffin to his files to any of the interview subjects I had, like all the professional gamblers, the sports book managers, the law enforcement agents, the U.S. attorney's officials. You don't need access to any of that. And you can read Tim Donaghy's book and go, wait a second, that's bull. He talks about all the sorts of things in the FBI investigation that he couldn't know. He talks about why the U.S. attorney's office made certain decisions. He, of course, knew none of that. He had crafted a narrative and the people thought the story was so sexy. You know, <laughs> you've probably heard that term, too good to check. Yeah. <laughs> it was so fascinating and so compelling that people just bought his BS and never thought, wait a second, how would he know any of this? They were so desirous of a conspiracy theory that they fell for his stuff. So anyway, by the way, I, Game in the Game didn't come out until 2011. But I thought, oh, my goodness, this is crazy. This guy is lying to the public on national TV and radio every day. So I created a blog devoted just to debunking, I mean, literally hundreds of his claims. Yeah. He says this, here's the court file. He says this, the judge says this. He says this, the FBI says that. It was just one after another because you just thought, oh, my goodness, by the time the game comes out, you know, we've lost the battle with regard to getting this history right. Yeah. That, that's my background into how I got involved in this. And I wound up interviewing, I spent three years on that project, uh, traveled all over the country, interviewing all the relevant people. I got access to the betting records of the gamblers. I researched betting lines um, for, your, for your audience. Don't forget, I didn't gamble. I still don't gamble. Yeah. And I, I, when I say betting lines, um, there's one website in particular, and it's called Don Best, D-O-N-B-E-S-T. I'm not a I'm not a sponsor, but I'm just letting you know if you're if you're these people who do this for a living, that seven grand or eight thousand dollars a year subscription to Don Best is cost of doing business because what it shows you on one computer screen, it shows you all of the betting lines for any game in the world. Mm. So you're gonna bet the Cowboys versus the Steelers tonight. I'm joking for some things that you get the idea. Like it says, a hypothetical game. It'll show you all the main sports books around the world and their real time betting numbers. Mm-hmm. They're favored by five here, they're five and a half there, or whatever. And they can all watch it on one screen. Well, these gamblers bet so much money that they can strategically manipulate those lines. 
So they'll bet in Asia, which is 13 hours ahead. Yeah. They get the lines to move. And then, of course, Europe comes six hours ahead of us and they'll move them further. And by the time people like me on the East Coast wake up, these guys have been purposely strategically betting money overseas to get the betting lines here in the United States to change. Mm. And they're going to bet on the other side. So they'll bet $200,000 in Asia and that two or three million on the other side of that game in the United States. Interesting. Interesting. These are these are high end math people. They're not mobsters. They have yeah. nothing to do with organized crime. And so when I wrote Game in the Game, I was not aware of all of this. And so the book winds up being the first third is roughly what I just described to you. It's the sociology of big time professional sports gambling, explaining how these people manipulate lines, how they bet, how they move money offshore to onshore and all that. And then the last two thirds is about the NBA betting scandal. Why the FBI investigation was flawed from the start. They told me this, by the way, this is, this is not me ripping the FBI. They explain why their investigation from the beginning was going to be flawed um, and how that how that happened and why the public, unfortunately, believes a, a lot of things that are factually incorrect. So that was how I got involved in all of this and ultimately what wound up happening. And uh, we're in 2022. And unfortunately, this, people aren't satisfied with the story of an NBA official fixing games for four NBA seasons. For some reason, that's not sexy enough. Yeah. <laughs> they want something grander, like, oh, NBA is controlling all these outcomes. And and that just didn't happen. And I'll be glad, by the way, to get into the uh, the mob aspect of this uh, at some point. Great. It's, and I'll re- spell out that website. I, 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 it was kind of blurred, the sound blurred a little bit. What was that website? Spell that out. <laughs> sure. My website is my name, seanpatrickgriffin.net, and Sean is spelled S-E-A-N, and Griffin is G-R-I-F-F-I-N, seanpatrickgriffin.net. And if people are on Twitter, they can see all of this stuff on Twitter at SPG Author. I spend a lot of time trying to uh, help and correct people in the media with this story because you see subtle little nuances. And Gary, you and people in your line of work would understand this. The FBI, there were, there were a handful of FBI agents that tried to figure out, okay, was Tim Donaghy fixing games? Well, no offense to the FBI agents, but why would they be better at figuring that out looking at game tape than you or me? Yeah. <laughs> we do, right? Well, beyond that, Tim Donaghy, when he cooperated with the FBI, he told them that he didn't know what games he bet. Well, think about that for a second. If you're the FBI and you're going to investigate this, well, you don't even know what games to look at. And beyond that, you also can't know what the betting lines were for those games. And you don't know what side was picked. Yeah. So what is there to research? And there's another part of that, which is that when they were looking at this, and Phil Scala, the supervisory special agent of the unit that housed the investigation in the FBI, he has said that they were looking for malicious calls, egregious calls. Yeah. Well, that's not what was happening. The pro gamblers said all along that what Donaghy was doing was he was calling technically correct fouls that are very rarely enforced. Things like palming a ball, illegal defense, things like that. Well, they're technically correct, so they would never get flagged as incorrect and subject to an audit. Yeah. And so the FBI had no way of figuring that out. And when they figured that out to begin with, the co- they, there were three co-conspirators, Donaghy the referee, Tommy Martino, who was Tim Donaghy's best friend, and Donaghy's, uh, pardon me, Martino's good friend, Jimmy Batista, who was a professional gambler. Well, Donaghy pleaded, he told them his story, and they're figuring out, okay, how can we check this out? Martino had perjured himself, which is why he became a cooperator. So even though they may have believed Martino when now he's cooperating, they can't rely on that because he had already been caught. Yeah. And Batista didn't cooperate and they didn't have access to his betting records, his laptop or anything like that. So they they really had no way of vetting this other than their review of game tape, which was flawed, as I just told you. Well, there's another part of this. The FBI office, when they took this on, honest to goodness, thought this was going to be an organized crime case because they heard mobsters on wiretaps. And if you watch the untold thing, they actually play some of the actual audio. But the problem was, after they got involved and they started researching the pro gamblers, they realized, oh, these are literally suburban house dads 
who work in their offices. They they literally have you know offices just like many of us do, uh, and they bet on a computer. They they have nothing to do with organized crime. The fact that organized crime was copying the bets which many people were by the end of this in the 06, 07 season. So they realized, oh my goodness, we could keep traveling two hours down from New York to Philly suburbs to do this case. We're mob guys. We want to go after the Gambino crime family. We don't need traveling down to Philly suburbs to do this white collar crime gambling case. So once Donaghy and, and uh, Martino decided to plead guilty, in their eyes, the case was over. And the pro-gambler, Jimmy Batista's lawyer, had told the U.S. Attorney's Office, Look, we'll go to trial if you like, but that trial has got to happen down here. The venue is here. You're you're arguing that the case should be in Brooklyn because that's where the NBA office is. But all the crimes alleged are in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and that's the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. So, you know, we're going to do this in Philly. And uh, and they, anyway, and so they got Batista to agree to plead guilty, not to fraud. The other two conspirators were um, talking about fraud. Batista agreed to illegal gambling. And his argument was, well, I'm an illegal gambler. So, of course, I'll yeah. think that, uh, which was a far lesser sentence. And and his and Batista's argument was, hey, Jim Donaghy was fixing games long before I ever hooked up with him in December of 06. <laughs> he was fixing games since at least the beginning of the 03 season. So I just came in and took over for somebody else. And I never told him to fix a game. He was doing that on his own. So whatever fraud you're talking about uh, was on Tim Donaghy, not on me. And uh, and that's those are the nuts and bolts of things. But when people say the FBI and the NBA concluded Donaghy didn't fix games, that's not true at all. The FBI did not do that. And, and in fact, not only did the NBA not conclude he didn't fix games, the, the NBA actually has said, at least to my knowledge, twice explicitly that they didn't conclude uh, Donaghy didn't fix games. Once ESPN, the magazine in 2019 had a long article about this, and they said that the NBA concluded they didn't fix games. Well, the NBA immediately issued a statement and said, oh, no, 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 we never concluded he didn't fix games. And then David Stern, he's now deceased, but when he, a retired commissioner, he was deposed in one of the court cases when sports gambling was up for debate being legalized. And in the deposition, he says, yeah, we never concluded that. And yet that's a constant mantra. Oh, no, no, we, they concluded that he didn't fix games because Donnie keeps telling people that, but it's not true. Hmm. So <clears throat> let me uh, kind of go back over a little bit of this. He, he, was, he was betting through his friend Martino who then took these bets to this Batista guy. Yes. And so it, he was winning. And then they, Batista particularly, it seemed like, knew that there was this pattern of winning, and then he was sharing it with other people. Then they took off with it. It's sort of like that. You're no direct face-to-face -face contact other than Donaghy and Martino. I said, just so you know, what happened was from, from the 03 04 season until the 06 07 season, Tim, Tim Donaghy was betting with a golfing buddy of his named Jack McNabb, who, by the way, is not a mobster, he's not even a professional gang. Well, so Jack, Tim Donaghy never knew where Jack was placing the bets. He was oh, okay. These games, and so he didn't know what Jack was doing, you know, whatever. Well, Jack was placing his bets with a professional gambler named Pete Ruggieri. Pete Ruggieri also cooperated with the government, by the way. Well, from 03 to 06, Ruggieri and his betting crew, which included Batista, are betting on these games. They don't, they don't know what the deal is, if there is any, between Donaghy and Kincannon, but they're just copying the bets because... Okay was happening jack and cannon would normally bet nba games for x number of dollars you know minimum amount of money and he would lose just like everybody else but starting in 03 certain games he's betting more money and on those games they're winning 78 percent of the time ah uh, interesting so the professional yeah. gamblers say wait a second what is going on about there they was betting five thousand dollars a game they said what is up with these five thousand dollar game bets and they said, oh, my goodness, the one common pattern is that their game's refereed by Tim Donaghy. Yeah. So they start hammering that. So so from 03 to 06, professional gamblers are betting millions every game around the world. But they can only do so much because they're relying on Jack and Cannon's pick to come in. 
Well, if you're going to manipulate the worldwide betting market or you're going to try and get millions of dollars on a game, you can't just do that with a click of a mouse. You have to put 100 grand here or 200. It's very strategic because the lines move in reaction to what you're doing. And so when it gets to 06 and Tim Donaghy complains to Martino, his best friend, that Jack and Cannon wasn't paying him. He said, well, Jack and Cannon keeps losing money down Atlantic City. He's a de- degenerate gambler. And I, I'm going to, I need to bet with somebody else. Well, Martino tells Batista. And Batista says, well, hey, I'm here. I'll, I'll gladly take over. That's when they have this infamous meeting at the International Marriott in Philadelphia in December of 06. I could talk an hour about the way that that's presented in the old t- untold story, by the way. So anyway, so they, they cut a deal. And that's what you see in Untold, which is they then cut a deal from that point forward that the picks are going to go to Jimmy Batista through Tommy Martino. But, you know, Gary, this is important for your audience. If your audience watches the Untold episode, you see Donaghy and Martino on screen talking about the code. Mm-hmm. Use the code on the phone that if, the, if they were picking the away team, and I forget which one it was, but you know, one was Chuck, which is these are these are Martino's brothers. One was Chuck, you know. Yeah. Well, people didn't realize that code only works if you know what games you're picking. If there are 12 NBA games that night, what does what does it matter if you ask how your mother is doing? That, <laughs> yeah, you have to you know. have to know what game. And and the reason I'm focusing on that is because the picks were only on games officiated by Tim Donaghy. Yeah. And that matters because for your audience who doesn't know this story, Tim Donaghy's story for, what, 13 years now has been that he didn't fix games. He had inside information. And because of that, he bet equally, if not more, on games he didn't officiate. And he was just as successful on the the games he bet that he didn't officiate. Well, the entire appendix of Gaming the Game is about this issue. Because I've got the betting records and the betting lines, and I demolish that story. But even if you don't have access to my my data, the code that I just mentioned destroys it too. Yeah, yeah. The code doesn't work if he's betting on other people's games. That was never. And by the way, all the cooperating witnesses, his best friend Martino, and all the pro gamblers, unfortunately, none of whom are mentioned in Untold, even though they had all that information. Um, you're left to, they left it out there as a he said, he said, he said story. That is not the case at all. Everything Tim Donaghy has said about this on the key matters is bull. And uh, anyway, so they all agree that the, the picks were only on games Tim Donaghy officiated. There was one moment where Tim Donaghy tried placing bets on other officials. And you can, again, you can look at the FBI files on this too, because all the cooperators agree on this too. They tried a few of them. They were all losers. And Batista stopped taking them. <laughs> so there's see, yeah. about that. Never mind my access to the data and whatever. Even you know, even the pro gamblers and all the cooperating informants all agree on them. Uh, and and he had to be real careful in not passing losers along, thinking they're winners, passing losers along to to especially mob guys. <laughs> they, they, they would. Well, I don't think. Well, I don't. Yeah, but I don't. I don't. I'm not. I don't even know if Donaghy ever even thought that. I mean, I don't know if you want to get into that. That's all. That's all media nonsense. There's no. The person. The person that Batista knew in New York was a Jewish gambler. Mm -hmm. What what happens? I mentioned moments ago that people are betting millions of dollars every day. Well, you can't just call up a sports book and bet a million bucks. Uh, There are only a handful of people in the worldwide market that handle that kind of money. Well, and they're called outs. So if you ask a pro gambler, well, you know, how do you bet money in Costa Rica or how do you bet money in uh, Curacao? They'll say, oh, my out in Curacao, my out in in Costa Rica. Well, his out in New York was this Jewish gambler. That Jewish gambler is the one who was betting with the Gambino crime family. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with this story. You know what I mean? Like, and by the way, by the time that happened, that was like, I want to say, Early to mid uh, 2007, the scandal had been going on since 03. The only reason we're talking about mob stuff is because Tim Donaghy wants us talking about mob stuff. Yeah, you can go, you can go look at what the FBI says in their files. You can look look. Yeah, you know this. The FBI is not shy about promoting organized crime cases. No, <laughs> you can go look. 
you'll never see any mention of organized crime, the mob, any of that stuff, either in the court filings, in the press releases, same thing's true for the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn, nothing. Incidentally, since we're all told to believe this is an organized crime extortion scheme, scheme by Tim Donaghy, not only were Tommy Martino and Jimmy Batista never charged with extortion, when the feds put in their, because Donaghy, of course, pleaded guilty, and they put in their sentencing agreement, they said, quote, Donaghy has never said he was anything other than a willing participant, unquote. And furthermore, when the judge sentenced Donaghy, she said he was, quote, unquote, more culpable than his co-conspirators. That's why for the media, including the untold episode, to present this to the public, what I just said to you happened in 2007. Yeah. You don't need to be an organized crime expert living in a box like I do reading all day. <laughs> this is public record. But they love the mob stuff and it gets viewers and clicks and ratings. But my goodness. So anyway, so I, I, the, the, I mean, you're, and by the way, the other, the other with regards to the, Tim Donaghy supposedly being afraid of the mob, the pro gambler, the pro conspirator, Jimmy Batista, he goes into drug rehab on March 18, 2007. According uh, to Donaghy, when he's on media, he goes, Wow, well, I was so glad I was out from the grip of organized crime and I didn't have to keep gambling any longer. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. When, when Batista goes into drug rehab, the scheme continues. Only now, Pete Ruggieri, that pro gambler I mentioned a few minutes ago, he takes over. Mm -hmm. He bets through, through Martino with Ruggieri for a handful of games into April. Again, you don't need access to Sean Patrick Griffin's files for this. You don't have to read Game in the Game for this. If you simply read the public record, Donaghy in public filings, when, that's, when the government says he was a cooperator, right, they're debating his sentence, it says that he, he provided information against Jack and Cannon and Pete Ruggieri. Well, why is he providing information against Pete Ruggiero? That's why. He's, that's what happens afterward. But beyond that, if you look at the plea deals, the plea deals from Martino and Donaghy are through April. The proffers for the pro-gamblers who cooperated are all through April. But Batista's plea deal is only through March. Because he went in drug rehab. Yeah, yeah. I could debunk Donaghy's BS story a hundred different ways. And people just won't do the homework. I don't understand it. It's, it's you know, it's, <laughs> I always say I'm not in the engineering department at the Citadel. I'm in the criminal justice department. Okay? <laughs> yeah. I'm proud of my work and I, I like to think I do a good job. But my goodness, this is, it's just light work. Yeah, interesting. And, and, but like you say, we, we love a mafia story. And, and I think he probably sensed that as, as the, it started coming down around his, his head and he knew, you know, and, and what a perfect out to say, you know, well, the mob made me do it. You know, yeah. I was scared from, I was in fear of my life. Now, having said that, why didn't he turn around and become a cooperator and testify against the mob? Why did nobody, you know, all of a sudden the Bureau does not drop a mob case just right. like that, just drop it. And never mention it again if if there really was something there because the first thing they did was go look at those gamblers and find out what their connections were back to the bob uh -huh. check their phone records and they're gonna yes. go buy phone records you know yep. okay he's called this guy you know 50 times in in about a two weeks period yeah. okay and that guy is an associate of this guy. yes uh -huh. and, and then and then you like go sit on the house whatever they're having those phone uh, the phone calls they go well yeah. when that guy gets a phone call and he goes over to this guy then he goes down the Ravenite Social Club, I could work that case. <laughs> well, here's the, that's what if, you do. That's, well, well, here's the thing. If you read Game in the Game, at that moment in time, Batista didn't know who the informants were or uh, any of this, right? But we, had, we did have access to the phone logs. And so if you looked at the phone logs, the pro gamblers he was betting with, including the, the the Jewish bookmaker I was just telling you about a moment ago, we're on there. And so Batista, this is back in 2008. He was just making an informed guess. He's like, if I had to guess, when I saw his name on those logs, I figured, okay, well, they're probably looking at, they're probably looking at him because we always heard on the street that he was connected to the Gambinos up in New York. So maybe that's how they figured all this out. And he was right. He didn't know it, but he was guessing right just based on, you know, the phone logs. Yeah, he, he would have been, but lots of times they don't. You don't want to give up your golden goose to a bunch of mob goons either. If you've got one, I know when I did a story on the Henry Hill Boston College 
betting uh, scheme. And, and they were, Jimmy Burke and the guys back in New York were worried about placing too much money here and there, letting other people know that they had this connection because then everybody's going to do it and then the cat's going to be out of the bag. So you really have to keep that on the down low. And well, <laughs> that didn't happen here. <laughs> that didn't happen because one, one this is one of the many things that the untold show gets wrong. Uh, there's a don't forget the entire show is based on Tim Donaghy's story. They don't tell the public that, but that's what you're watching. And, uh, and, and they also don't tell people that it's been debunked for a decade. But so when you're seeing Tim Donaghy's view of, of history here, he says that, yeah, well, uh, we all agree. Tim, Tim Donaghy, Tommy Martino and Jimmy Batista, we all agree that we keep our mouths shut and not tell anyone we we're doing this. And he says, but, you know, of course, we know that Batista uh, didn't honor that because he shared it with this professional gambler in New York. Well, as I write in Game in the Game, he not only shared it with the professional gambler in New York, he shared with another professional gambler offshore. So yeah. debate about that. But what they don't show and untold because it doesn't fit their narrative, Donaghy stopped betting with Jack and Cannon in November of 06. But he, he starts betting again with them in February. He was part of the problem because he started sharing the bets again with Ken Cannon in February. And Tommy Martino, the other co-conspirator, he started giving the picks to a friend of his who was running a, a casino offshore in Costa Rica. Yeah. <laughs> and so in the gambling world, when you've got that kind of money being bet on one side of one game, yeah. the algorithms pick that up and they go, OK, we don't know what's going on here, but there's something wrong. So pro gamblers who know nothing about Tim Donaghy, Jimmy Batista, you know, any, but they're just following the numbers. Mm -hmm. so they start copying the movement of lines and they move even more. That's why Pete Ruggieri shut the scheme down. And that's important, by the way. The reason that Pete Ruggieri shut the scheme down in April of 07, by the way, not the FBI, not the NBA, and certainly not Tim Donaghy, as he says, it's Pete Ruggieri, the pro gambler, who shuts the scheme down. He shuts it down because the way that pro gamblers make their money is manipulating those lines and increasing their odds. Yeah. Well, he's no longer in control of this. Way too many, many people around the world know that Donaghy's fixing games and they're copying the bets on Donaghy's games. I'm saying the untold production team knew everything I'm telling you and your audience. Yeah. And they chose for reasons that we'll probably never understand to produce that product that everyone's talking about now. Yeah. Make it look like it was organized crime, which as you say, is much sexier than this kind of, uh, it's like this uh, community in which you start a little bit of a story in a community and they all have this interest and, and other people pick up on it pretty soon. They're, they don't know who Tim Donahue is. Yes. Donahue is. They don't know who he is. They don't care who he is. They just know there's these patterns or, or there's some guy that's doing something. And mm -hmm. so they, they follow that pattern. They don't, you know, they may finally figure out, oh, you know, he's a ref. You know, the really smart guys will figure yeah. and really research it and they'll see that's who it probably is. Yeah. And and then as as I said before, you don't want that to get out. It starts getting out and, and it screws it up for everybody. And then you're saying that these big gamblers, it took away their control over, yeah. over mm -hmm. what they had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Interesting, huh? See, I didn't really know about that. Uh the I knew there's a lot of money went down. There's more and more all the time, and that worldwide thing and the different time zones. It's a little bit like they used to like try to pass post horses back in the old days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hold up the wire service, <laughs> not find out what the winner was, and then go lay a bunch of money down. Yeah, it's true. And well, what's funny, I, I described this in the game in the game before technology happened, these professional gamblers would beat the brains out of local bookmakers because they weren't sophisticated enough to know that that's how you can do this. Yeah. You could strategically bet over offices before, but the guy, you know, your local bookie, in my case, in Philly or in New York, wherever, they're not aware that that's happening. They're picking up their morning newspaper. Uh -huh. They don't realize that that line is already wrong. <laughs> now, of course, you can monitor everything second by second, minute by minute. But years ago, they didn't know. So there was a period of time in the 90s where, man, you could crush a local a sports book if you were really good at this. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, and it probably now makes a little more sense about Lefty Rosenthal and why he was such a great sports handicapper. He was the, you know, the big yeah. stick in sports handicapping yeah. and was well known among mob guy. He could give Tony Accardo you know, winners regularly. 
Yeah. Well, that guy was the kind of guy that made those connections, I'm sure, and and got in on that sure. that kind of information <laughs> level. He went to Florida, where it would be probably closer to that. He left Chicago mm-hmm. and went to Florida, and then went to Vegas, and yeah. you know he opened up the sports book in in the Vegas casino, so he would have been privy mm-hmm. to all those. Yeah. Issues. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is this story. These pro gamblers really rise in the '90s, in part because of offshore sports books, but especially because of technology. Well, as you and your audience know. The dominance of organized crime, like our generation knew it, has been down since the 70s. Once everyone rules, you know, it's not like, you know, years ago when I grew up in Philly, there were certain sections of the city you couldn't open a business yeah. without knowing who you had to pay. That Those days have been over for decades. So these guys, for the most part, missed it. And there's a great line in the book, by the way, where um, Batista says, the pro gambler says, you know, people talk about organized crime all the time and they don't realize in our world, we're the whales and they're the fish. <laughs> we're the ones who take money out of their market, not, not the other way around. We, we're the ones who can move that kind of weight. They can't do that. They're just, you know, they're relying on our numbers and our access to all this money. It's not the other. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that, so, that, so, yeah, the whole, the whole mop thing is um, very, very much misunderstood. We're the whales. Too, is, oh, well, look, Gary, this is important. This is important, too. With the pro gamblers, obviously, if, the, if they also – or bookmakers, they, they're generally not, but sometimes they'll also take bets. Generally speaking, they're placing bets. But on the occasions where they're taking bets, and your audience knows this, obviously betters lose. That's the whole point of running a book. Well, in their world, though, they didn't care about people losing money because they weren't worrying about breaking somebody's leg or anything like that. The way that they would allow people to pay back their debts was inside information. Yeah. And I describe some of these stories in Game in the Game. And some of the stories are hilarious. Yes, it can be trainers in a, you know, in a locker room or whatever. One was a, um, a, a role delivery person who used to go into the Philadelphia Old Veterans Stadium. Uh, and because he was going in the bowels of the arena, he got access to certain information. There's a funny story, though, before technology really hit. Uh, there was a person who was giving them inside information from Chicago. And so if you were betting the Chicago Cubs, just again, I don't know if your audience knows about gambling, you not only can pick game outcomes, but you can pick how many runs are going to be scored. And there's an over under on how many runs are going to be scored. Well, obviously, at Wrigley Field, if the wind is blowing out, that's going to radically change. Yeah. So they would send this guy out to Wrigley Field, and his only job was to report whether the flags were blowing out because that was going to give them an edge and they would bet bet the over or under based on that. So anyway, one day this guy calls and says, yeah, yeah, no problem here. Um, You know, bet, you know, bet the under because you know, there's not not much wind here at all. So they place their bets. Well, I don't know if you remember this, but satellite, and they might still might still might happen. Satellite television feeds go up a little bit earlier than the actual broadcast that we're all going to see on TV. Well, these pro gamblers had access to those satellite feeds. So even before the game starts in Chicago, they see the screen up ready to be broadcast and they see the flags. <laughs> out and, we, and, and so they call the guy like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're going to just bet heavy on the under. And he goes, oh, oh I won't create any curse. But he says, oh, sorry, I'm standing behind a wall. <laughs> You know, and there's like, so they have, they had people all over the country doing that sort of stuff. And, you know, some were not so bright, but regardless, you know, that they, there's a currency in inside information. Uh, and that's one thing that I described in Game in the Game that's even more important now. Now that we've legalized sports gambling, if, you're, if your audience doesn't know this, not only can you bet outcomes of games and pick a team or a player, you can obviously pick over, under, on game, but there's a lot of things going on in games. So if you're playing, if you're betting tennis, what are the odds that the person who's hitting the first serve has a foot fault? You can literally bet any number of like really. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, there, well, if you're somebody who's trying to curtail that, it's hard to prove that somebody threw a set or threw a point or threw a point in a certain way because yeah. a gambler paid them. Yeah, it would be it's really be impossible hard. to detect. And that's that's where we are now. Now, one of the controls on that is that you can't bet as much on those propositions as you can on a game outcome. Okay, yeah. If somebody wanted to be sophisticated and was really devoted to this, you could do that. Yeah. And, and I know uh, back in the 70s, and the mob was, was still probably as strong as the gambling 
these sophisticated gamblers, they would have guys, somebody, a clubhouse boy, a, a, mm. a, a usher, a, somebody that could be around the locker room and be around the players. That in Kansas City, we had one, you know, and all of a sudden we realized we see this guy out at this mob joint and, and is kind of known for cocaine going through it. And this guy's like got this glassy eyed stare and they're like, hell, that's a guy that's out at the Royals, man. So, you yeah. know, they would have those people in, in every clubhouse of every major sport. So I, I would imagine that Bob, you know, some low level mob bookies working with, you know, they sure. just this huge network of information coming out yeah, about yes that uh -huh. sure yeah that's dumb Interesting. yeah i don't i i don't know with regard to organized crime i don't know if that's still happening we see i i, I don't my expertise is silly yeah. and they're, they're so irrelevant uh it's remarkable yeah it's pretty much like that here too yeah you know, it's it's like yeah. I, it was back in the 70s i don't know what's going on Look, in your area in mine your local newspaper had beat reporters and that's all they covered yeah Organized crime. That was their. That was their. Beat. Yeah, and they so don't. You, you, you've had George Anastasia on, I think, before. You know, like, that was his career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you still have a little bit more in Philly. Yeah, you still have reporters that covered Phil Swatweiser and. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, Phil yeah. kind of recovers as best he can, but sure, yeah, yeah. Nobody. I mean, in Kansas City, even the what we used to call the One Squad, they don't have an organized crime squad. The bureau, that local bureau, they have. If it's a crime, it goes to the bank robbery squad or the you yeah. know, uh, staff of interstate shipment squad or front, mm -hmm. you know, that white collar crime, Kansas City Police Intelligence Unit. It's all uh, yes. Joint Task Force on Terrorism and, yeah. and other things. Philly's so so the same way. Philly's the same exact way. Yeah. I mean, even when I was in, in 92, Lou, when I last time I was in intelligence, you know, we were working on more uh, narcotics, mainly in the black community and those kinds of organizations than any mob stuff. So well, the, one, the only the only thing that's left, really, and, and I'm, I'm sure they have this in your region. Um, I haven't done it since I moved to Charleston. I've just been too busy. But I used to routinely lecture a group called McLaughlin, and that's an acronym for Middle Atlantic Great Lakes Organized Crime Law Enforcement Network. Mm -hmm. It was it was all throughout obviously the mid-atlantic and east coast or whatever and it was all the people that you and i would have as colleagues 20 or 30 years ago yeah uh so regardless of whether they're currently in an intelligence unit as opposed to an organized crime unit they still train together they still share information and there's a fusion center for that or whatever yeah, yeah. and my understanding is they have four of those around the country it's like four or five or something like that but, um that's it yeah the, the days of an or a dedicated organized crime unit are you know Huh, interesting. It's uh, well, things change, don't they? I, I had a lot of fun back in the day, but <laughs> all right. Uh, Sean, go back over just one thing, case that other website that the professional gamblers use that cost so much money. What was that again? It's it's Don Best, D O N B E S T, donbest.com. They were kind. When I wrote Gaming the Game, they gave me a free subscription uh, to do my research, which was invaluable. Uh, and so, uh, but it's like, and as I say, if you're a pro gambler, it's worth the cost because it, it gives you information, real time information. You can literally set that website up to give you alarms if you're looking for certain trends or certain actions or whatever. I mean, yeah. it's now yeah, it's it's really sophisticated. And by like Gary, don't forget, before I took on gaming the game, I knew none of this. <laughs> yeah. gambler, I don't research gambling for a living. Uh, of course, for the last ten years, especially with sports gambling. Uh, with the legalization of sports gaming, I've been really involved. I, I don't know, like gaming the game was actually cited in the congressional record uh, cool. in, in the push for legalized sports gambling. And uh, it's been a crazy experience, but this was never my intent. I just wanted to see what the story was and see if there was any. <laughs> you're, you're like me. You see something, you think, well, that sounds interesting. I think I'll go take a closer look. And then you start in and say, well, that's really interesting. Let's look a little more. Next thing you know, you're obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It is, that is absolutely what happened here. I, I take no credit for this. I mean, <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been Sean Patrick Griffin. Uh, that Your other book that you did on the Black Mafia. Remind our wiretappers sure. what the name of that was. Sure. It's Black Brothers Incorporated, The Violent Rise and Fall of Philadelphia's Black Mafia. And you know, get that book or, and listen to the podcast we did. You know, I forget these guys in Philly. They, there was a, a thing that hit the headlines big time in in national headlines. 
they went down, they were contracted to go down to Washington, D.C. and kill a bunch of Hanafi black Muslims that were living in a house that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, I think, financed and, mm -hmm. and we had, was his sect of, of, of black, uh, Islam. So it's it's a heck of a story, that uh, black mafia out of Philadelphia. I mean, one heck of a story. They owned that city, or at least they're part of it. I, think. Yeah, I know, they did. For, for, for 20 or 30 years, it was not a small matter, yeah. You know, another note, I don't see this so much as we used to back in the day. And when it comes to black narcotics gangs, we used to always have one or two what we'd call kingpins in the black community. I mean, they would mainly one who would be the man, would be the guy that would the most important guy that everybody would know. And and I don't see that. I ask these young policemen and nobody seems to know if there's a, a kingpin no. anymore. Well, actually, um, there, you may know this. There was a documentary made in 2007 about my book, Black Brothers Incorporated, and they interview the head of that investigation. Of, he's retired, an FBI officer named um, Jim Sweeney. Great guy. And uh, he says in there that there were two huge black mafia prosecutions in Philly. One was 74 and the next one was 84, 85. And he said that by taking out that second level of leadership in 84, 85, it just broke the syndicate forever. Yeah. And now it's more complicated because now you've just got pockets of people and it's actually harder to figure out who's in charge because yeah. who's really in charge. So that, that's what it looked like to me. The last guy we had, a guy named Doc Dearborn, he came back out of the penitentiary and he was shortly after, he was just selling drugs and some of his buyers uh, killed him. I mean, uh, you know, just immediately he got killed by the younger guys. So yeah. he, he couldn't get back in and, and do anything. Yeah. And by the way, Gary, one last thing with, with regard to Game in the Game. The subtitle of the book is The Story Behind the NBA Betting Scandal and the Gambler Who Made It Happen. And one of the reasons I'm upset about The Untold Show is because if you read Game in the Game, yes, it's the first time Jimmy Batista, the pro gambler, ever spoke publicly, but it's not from his perspective. And what I mean by that is they all disagree on things like the profits. Well, I have an opinion on that. If Martino says that he paid Donaghy 115000 120000 that's what I write. Don, I mean, Batista says it's two hundred one to 209000 Fine. Donaghy says he only got paid thirty to forty. Mm -hmm. Present everybody's perspective in the book. I wanted this 50 years from now. I want people to say, oh, what happened in the NBA betting scandal? Oh, we're reading in the game. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, folks, I'll have links to that, to the Amazon link. Uh, uh, for that book if you want to get that and uh also uh the uh black mafia book i could never keep those titles black mind. brothers incorporated black brothers incorporated and and just check the show notes on either the youtube or the uh, uh on my website and on the show notes that on your podcast app will have it too you can always uh, you can click on those links and go to that so Sean, I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, you're always a, a pleasure to talk to and a, and a, a fountain of, of good, solid information. I like that good, solid information. And, and you're well-researched and, and well thought out and, and, and from an academic, but not maybe not academic, you make it enjoyable from more than the academic uh, look at, at uh, organized crime. So I, I always appreciate that. And you're very kind. I, don't forget to look out for motorcycles when you're out there, because y'all know I ride a motorcycle. And I, uh, uh, if you have a, a friend or if you yourself has a problem with PTSD and, and you're in the service or you've been in the service, be sure and go to the VA. They have a hotline and you can get some help there. So, guys, uh, thanks for listening. And, Sean, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Ken. All right, great. All right, great. All right, great. All right, great. All right, great.